Lecture number 13. Well, we talked a little bit about Charles Anthon, didn't we, last time? Didn't I finish telling you about that in this class? Did I tell you about Charles Anthon? Let me just throw him on the screen here. This is the only picture in church literature of Charles Anthon. This is the first time it's ever been published. And I was able to get it from a book, and I had my daughter work over a weekend, day and night, to get it out of the book and, and paint this portrait of him so we would be able to publish it, because I couldn't get it out of the book, naturally. <coughs> and, uh, but we got a copy of it from the Congressional Library, and I don't know why he wouldn't have his picture taken. But we do have that picture of him, and he's a very distinguished-looking man. And you notice in the book I pointed out to you that this man... Those of you on the back row, can we have your attention up here? Tina will do that all by herself now. <clears throat> I want you to remember for your examinations that um, this man was the most notable. He was the best known of all the classical scholars in America. And nobody had ever checked on him before. I couldn't find any place uh, that anybody had done any work on him before Professor Stanley Kimball of... of um, uh, the Southern Illinois University published an article in BYU Studies in the spring of 1970. He didn't put in his picture, but he put a little of his background. That's the first time we realized that when Isaiah said he was a learned man, he was the most learned man in the classical languages in America. That was really interesting. He was seen by Nephi, seen by Lehi, seen by Isaiah. And I, I think it's just thrilling to think that here... 700 B.C., Isaiah saw him, described him, saw that he would get certain things handed to them that were one of the great archaeological treasures of the earth, a copy of some things that had been written in ancient America, and he said, well, bring them to me, I'll translate them. Martin Harris, the farmer, says, well, of course, a lot of this is sealed up, you know. Well, of course, he said, I can't read a sealed book. And he said the very words that Isaiah said he would say back 700 and some odd years B.C., and when Martin Harris came back with the book, he said, you know, uh, <clears throat> Professor, um, you're the man in the book of Isaiah. And uh, Dr. Anton said, uh, I am who? Well, you know, Isaiah said that when we presented this to you, you'd say you couldn't read a sealed book. And that's just what they said you'd say. And I got the book now if you want to read it. He said, don't you dare leave that in my house. Don't you dare. You take that out. Get out of here. I don't want to be that man in Isaiah. That was his reaction. I don't want to be that man. Couldn't help himself. He's a historical character. He's a prophetic character. Charles Anton. It says he had a book. He printed a book which was a college text every year for a period of about 35 years. Now that's fantastic to me. It took me 12 years to do the first 2,000 years. About 9 years to do the third 1,000. About 8 years to do the fourth 1,000. I've been on this Book of Mormon study now for nearly 10 years. And for him to produce a text, one text a year, just amazes me. And notice what it says. Edgar Allan Poe says, if not absolutely the best, he's at least generally considered the best classicist in America. And Harper's Weekly said Anton was more widely known in Europe than any other American commentator on classical authors. All right, now let me just tell you a little story briefly. You know part of this story, but just so that you'll be sure you have it in mind. When Joseph Smith was completing the translation of the Book of Mormon by the power of God because he was a relatively ignorant person as his wife says um, he, he did not have the ability to to do any of these kind of things later on he was a brilliant writer at the time he was 39 I can put up put his writing up against uh, any writing of, of his century uh, he was a great speaker he could hold an audience for two hours at 22 and 23, God said in the Doctrine and Covenants, I gave this book to you in your weakness, Joseph, that no man might be able to say that you produced it from your own strength, that it might be easy for them to get a testimony of it and not try to just shrug it off as though you had done it because I wanted to do it at a time when everybody who knew you knew you couldn't do it. And he couldn't have done it, of course, when he was brilliant. No scientist could have done it. Any scientist would have done research and come up with all the wrong answers a hundred years ago. They'd have had uh, uh, South Arabia, a beautiful jungle, because all the guidebooks said it was a beautiful jungle and nobody had been there. They were guessing because they thought it was to be the same as in Africa. He wouldn't have used the word fountain, would he, for a, uh, for a drainage basin like the Aqaba Gulf. 
Why, that was shocking to people to think of a gulf being translated fountain. Then we find out that's the only word the ancients used for a gulf. All kinds of things in this book. Anyway, as they were coming to the end of the translation, uh, the, the book itself said there were going to be three witnesses, didn't it? Somebody's going to get to see this book. Up to this time, Joseph hasn't been allowed to show it to anyone. And there's a possibility there that he got permission to show it to his wife on one occasion. But that's apocryphal, so we're not sure. Everybody wonders who it's going to be. So Joseph himself doesn't know who's going to be. Joseph's father wants to be the one. His brother Hiram wants to be the one. His wife Emma says, I certainly ought to be one. I mean, I've been going through all these sacrifices while it was translated. Um, well, all the Whitmer family wanted to be in on it. And, and good old Martin Harris, bless his heart, He's so nearly twice as old as Joseph Smith. He was up in his 40s. And he'd helped in the beginning, but he went and lost 116 fool's cap pages of the translation. <coughs> anticipated, fortunately, by the Lord, so it was taken care of. But anyway, oh, he'd like to see those plates. And of course, Oliver Cowdery had done the whole writing of it, so he hoped he'd be included. David Whitmer was Oliver Cowdery's best friend. He went down the wagon, brought Joseph and Oliver clear up from Harmony, about 110 miles, the so they could finish it without the mobs bothering them. He wanted to be a witness. Who did it turn out to be? Three very special witnesses anticipated by Nephi and the ancient prophets that turned out to be Martin Harris. Martin Harris got a chance to be a witness. Uh, he, he thought he was totally rejected of the Lord, and he was for a while. The Lord said he would give him another chance, at least let him be the witness. And then Oliver Cowdery and Martin uh, and David Whitmer. And Oliver Cowdery and David Whitmer were very good friends, and Oliver Cowdery married David Whitmer's sister. Kind of interesting. And so um, on the day that they are to be witnesses, Mother Smith said they, they had a prayer meeting as a family. And they knelt down and they had several prayers to ask the Lord now that, to forgive them their sins and let them be worthy to receive this tremendous experience. Haven't, hasn't been anything like this since the days of the apostles. As Joseph got up, he walked over to the older man and he said, Martin, unless you'll humble yourself, you're not going to get the witness today. Well, Martin wanted this worse than anything. You see, his wife told him that he was being fooled. He knew he wasn't being fooled, but he was so anxious to persuade her. He wanted something to happen so he could go back and say, I had a scientific witness. Uh, he had, uh, the reason that he borrowed the 116 fool's cap pages is because he was so impressed with what was in the book. He said, if my wife reads that, she'll believe it, I think. So I you remember he asked three times for it, and finally the Lord said, well, let him take it if you want to do it on your own responsibility. And of course, then they were lost. In any event, now he hopes he can get it, and here's Joseph, this young man, telling him, the Spirit of the Lord has whispered, Martin, if you don't humble yourself, you're not going to get it. So they're walking out into the woods where they can be by themselves, and Martin Harris all the way is saying to himself, um, I'm going to be humble. Oh, I'm proud of my humility now. I think I'm humble now. You know, people try to talk themselves into their humility. Well, they get out there and start praying. They knelt together in a little group. Here are four men, Joseph Smith and the three witnesses. They kneel on the ground and they start praying. Every one of them prayed. Did anything happen? It didn't. And Martin Harris said, I, I was afraid the Lord had not forgiven me and I and he hasn't forgiven me and you brethren aren't going to get any kind of a witness as long as I'm here I've just got to get forgiveness first let alone a witness so he went away and Joseph didn't stop him and he went over into the next ravine and the prophet Joseph said all right brethren let's kneel so they knelt and they started praying again each one of them praying and at one point it all opened up and here was a table just covered with plates there were the large plates of Nephi, uh, there were the brass plates, there were the, uh, the, the gold plates, there was a sword of Laban, there was the Liahona, um, the Urim and Thummim, all spread on this table. And uh, Moroni was there with it. He appeared with it. And he invited them to come forth and turn the leaves. Afterwards, the three witnesses said somebody, one of them thought it was Moroni, and Joseph said no. No, that voice came from way up above and behind Moroni. 
it said this is the work of God and now you have the responsibility to tell the world that you have had your in other words scientific witness you did witness with your eyes and you did turn the leaves and you felt them with your hands and you did it together so that you knew you were not deceived in any way there was a what? oh yeah that was later where it was taken where the sword of Laban was put across the plates you remember yes that's the last time the sword of Laban was was seen that's that that happens later and uh, so when the witness was over the vision closed everything's gone now it's in another dimension it's all gone Oliver is talking to uh, David Whitmer his good friend they're both about the same age about nine months apart or something and they're sitting there talking Joseph said I'll go see if I can find Martin so he went over into the next ravine he found him and Martin is down there just praying to the Lord that uh, he'll forgive him forgive me forgive me forgive me Joseph said Martin they had been good friends and Martin had helped him before that terrible tragic loss of the, uh, of the translation he said can I kneel with you so they, they knelt together and they started to pray and there it happened and it opened up and, and they were kneeling at the time and the vision was there he got to see everything and he apparently stayed on his knees there was a table, a table in front of them but in handling the plates he apparently just stayed right on his knees because when the vision closed Martin Harris got up off his knees and he said it's enough it is enough and stumbled almost fell backwards as he stumbled over a log this is wonderful I've seen it now I've, this is enough I've had it that's alright I've, I've seen it for myself he was so excited and Mother Smith said when he came into the house he was just so th thrilled and excited the others were rather quiet meditative not Martin Harris I, she's got to believe me now she's just got to believe me I saw it I saw it myself it was just wonderful so the three of them composed their witness, which appears in the front of the plates, uh, the front of the Book of Mormon. And it is their solemn witness that they not only saw the plates, what else did they say they saw? They saw Moroni. Now you see, when Mother Smith said when Joseph came back, he was almost like her little boy. He's only 23. And he comes over and he just knelt down beside her. She was in a rocking chair. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, she said. They'd been out there nearly all day. And he suddenly, he just... Uh, knelt down beside a rocking chair and put his head in her lap and he said now mother people will know for themselves I feel like a mountain had been lifted off my shoulders others have been able to see now now later on in life after he had been killed after Joseph had been killed uh, they interviewed his wife and I put that in your text because when you go to the information center you, you'll hear it recorded you can sit there and hear it recorded as you hear Emma Smith say my belief in the Book of Mormon is of divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. When acting as his scribe, your father, she was being interviewed by her son, would dictate to me hour after hour. And when returning after meals or interruptions, he would at once begin where he had left off without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read back to him. This was an unusual thing for him to do. It would have been impro improbable that a learned man could do this. And for one so ignorant and learn unlearned as he was, it was simply impossible. People said, well, Joseph Smith wrote that book. Oh, she said, you don't know my husband. You see, this was at a time, a very primitive period of development for my husband. Well, uh, those witnesses had a very difficult time in the church in later years. Uh, Martin Harris uh, uh, stayed in Kirtland. And uh, the brethren had to go back and get him years later. Brigham Young uh, was sent back and got Martin Harris, and he, he finally came out and he died at Hiram up in Cache, Cache Valley. He's buried up there. Um, David Whitmer and um, Oliver Cowdery uh, got a little bit of pride in their hearts and they were assigned to go down and be the leaders of the church down in Missouri and got all um, uptight about Joseph's leadership wouldn't obey and wouldn't follow wouldn't do what they were told to do said to do things a little different way they said we were with Joseph in the beginning we know as much about it as he does and the Lord was very angry with them and uh, they were both excommunicated and after about 10 years, Oliver Cowdery found his way back into the church and went down to, con to convert David Whitmer back and said, Joseph's dead now. The saints are on the way to the mountains. Um, we're, we're, we're out of the church. We were. We, let's get back in. I've, I've been rebaptized now. I went clear out to winter quarters to be baptized. I was baptized by the very man that excommunicated me, Orson Hyde. 
I had given him the priesthood originally and then I had to get it back from him. Now, now, David, let's get back in the church and get. I want to go all over the world and bear testimony to what we know is true. We let pride get in our way and we got our feelings hurt and we were wrong. David said, No, I, I didn't leave the church. The church left me. And uh, he died outside of the church, but David, or Oliver Cowdery, died that very, very winter. Got pneumonia, died. He wasn't very old, I think about 42. Real interesting. That was the Lord's way, I think, of saying to the skeptic, if there was any problem about the testimony of those men or any fraud, when their feelings were hurt, they certainly would have said something about it. They'd have had their own little water gate, you see. But David Whitmer said on his deathbed, I want you to know I saw the angel, I saw the plates, and while Joseph and I had our falling out, I testify to you that what is in the front of that Book of Mormon is what we saw. And thus it's gone to all the world, to people of all denominations, because that book wasn't for any particular one church, that was for the whole world, to testify that Jesus is the Christ, that the Bible is true. And you remember in the days when, uh, down through the terrible days of the Dark Ages, You see, when the Catholic fathers kept the scriptures intact and didn't allow them to be destroyed, that was a great blessing to all humanity. And now here comes the Book of Mormon and saying that scripture is true. So that was what it was all about. Now, we were talking here just a minute before class about the fact that the inspired version contains much of this material that that, uh, Nephi recorded, suggesting that maybe in the plates of Laban, The original Isaiah contained many of these things which have been stripped down, which is a real interesting possibility. We have to pursue that a little bit further. Yes. What will happen to Emma Smith? Well, she had gone through so much. Her husband had been assassinated. Her brother-in-law, Hiram, was killed. She was weary. She had her little children around her. Brigham Young says, the, the Lord says, now go to the mountains just as Joseph prophesied. We have to build a commonwealth in the mountain. She said, no, I'm staying. So she did. She didn't come. And Mother Smith stayed with her. Mother St- and Emma became just a little, I say, not hostile exactly, but she didn't, um, well, when Joseph died, so did her spirit. She just existed after that in a very ordinary way. And She'd been a most extraordinary woman up to that time. She just became a person after that. So the brethren tried and tried to encourage her and help her and pick her up as they had Martin Harris. They were successful in, in getting him. He was, he, he'd lost his, uh, in case of Martin Harris, he came out the mountains. And as he came down Immigration Canyon on the road and saw this lovely city in the valley, guess what Martin Harris said? Oh, look what the Book of Mormon did. That's all he knew about the church was the Book of Mormon. All the rest of it, the organization and the structuring and the Quorum of the Twelve and all of this that had been added, this was all out of his candy. Just look what we did now, that Book of Mormon. Now that, well, that was the foundation, no doubt about it, but that wasn't the restoration of the church nor the priesthood nor a multitude of other things. Uh, so Emma's, well, she deserves a lot of blessings, that's all I can say. It was too bad that she kind of let down, but she deserves a lot of blessings. All that I've read Smith, and what I've heard of the lectures, it seems like she really gave Joseph a hard time a lot of time. She did toward the last, yeah, because he was being required to do some very difficult things, and I was close enough to the whole program a little later on to realize that it was a trial and a tribulation. I wouldn't be... I wouldn't judge her because uh, she really had been through the mill. And so I would just sort of leave that to the powers that be. But she did give him a hard time. And right at the end, right toward the last, she could see what was happening and uh, she didn't like it. And uh, she was a little bit like the wife of um, Andrew Jackson. I don't know whether you've read uh, Jackson's life, but... His wife didn't want him to be president, and his wife didn't. She just wanted him to come home at night at 5.30 when the work is done, and the whistle blows, and sit down, and take off his shoes, and cook, cook his supper for him, and just sit there and have a nice little talk. And she liked to sit by the fireplace and smoke her corn cob pipe, and she didn't like Andy Jackson wandering off trying to be president and everything. 
And in the White House, she was miserable, absolutely miserable. He just loved her and said, well, my dear, put up with it. I know this is my, I have to do these sort of things. And oh, why, why, why? So for sometimes wives don't quite catch the vision of their husband's destiny. And so that's the situation there. Now, there, as, as Nephi came toward the close, I was very interested in what the Lord had to say about the Jews there in chapter 29. The Lord really takes after us Christians. Because when the Book of Mormon comes forth, there was a warning that the, a lot of Christians would reject the Book of Mormon and say, well, but we've got a Bible already. And the Lord says, yes, you, you, you have a Bible. It's, it was kept by the Catholic fathers for you and uh, so forth. But um, do you really appreciate uh, this Bible? It originated, you know, with Jews. And what have you been doing to the Jews? So I just gave you a little resume of what they'd been doing to the Jews. They'd been massacring them. And the Lord says they, they're a hard people. They've gone through a period of apostasy. But you're supposed to lift them up and help them find their way. And so to some, some Christians have. They've helped the Jews find their way. Uh, but at the present time, the, the Jewish people are still in a state of, a, of, of apostasy. They really have lost their way. Cardinal, or rather... Um, Rabbi uh, Magnan in Los Angeles told me one night when I came out to speak at, the, at his temple there on Wiltshire Boulevard, he says, you know, nine out of every ten Jews are lost. We call them lost Jews. They don't know where they're going. They can't become Christians. They don't believe in the religion of their fathers, so they become atheists. And if they become atheists, they become criminals or communists. So I have an awful hard time holding my people together. And I said, well, I think there's something better in store for them. He said, there must be. I'm sure there must be. And so later, Rabbi um, Magnum came up and spoke at BYU. We had a real good visit together. He said, you know, I kind of feel at home here. I said, you are home, Rabbi. You're home. You're home. So he, had, he got a Book of Mormon, and I said, you'll find a lot about your people in that book. I do feel at home. I was talking to a man the day before yesterday. He said, you won't remember me, but um, uh, you were responsible for my baptism back in Washington. And I said, no. Well, now let me uh, refresh my mind. Well, he said, uh, you were teaching the Sunday school class back there, and, and he said, and I, uh, my mother and I just started attending a lot of churches, and we just kind of wandered into the Washington Chapel there one day, and my wife, uh, my mother didn't want to go there. She said, you won't like Mormons. So he said, I didn't really go there until she was sick one day. And so he said, I wandered in, and I came inside the foyer of the chapel, and a man met me at the door and shook my hand, and I, there were three or four other people standing there, and he said, I just stopped. And I said, I'm home. I'm home. I've arrived. This is it. And he said, and then I walked in, and you were having your Sunday school class, and he said, it was amazing. He said, about 350 people there. And he said, I found out there were about 50 more, like myself, who weren't members of the church there, and... So he said, you won't remember, but he said, you talked to me a couple of times, but the missionaries then baptized me, and I came on in the church. And then he went on ahead and became a doctor. So you just never know where these seeds go, you see, because I didn't remember him. But we were averaging about 10 baptisms a month. I was state mission president then, and I, it was a thrilling assignment. And we had the people attending from the legations and the embassies all around there on 16th Street and Columbia Road. It was one of the most beautiful churches in all Washington, the most expensive chapel the church had ever built. Had Moroni up on the top, and it was quite the, all the buses stopped by it as they were going around. And all of a sudden, people were beginning to say, what, what is this business of the Mormons anyway? Uh, over at Georgetown University, where they train the run, young priests, I was invited to give a whole series of lectures to the young priests on Mormonism. And I spoke in 85 Protestant churches in Washington, D.C. in two years gave Easter sermons at several of them. A uh, the Presbyterian minister came and said, will you tell my people about the Book of Mormon? And I said, yes, be happy to. And so I gave my talk, and, and when it was through, he held up the book, and he said, now you know why I've been quoting out of this book. <laughs> I said, now this has been growing. This is growing all over the world. A great thing. Gee, the Lord said, I'll do a marvelous work and a wonder. I'll do a marvelous work and a wonder. And, and he really has been doing it. All right, um, now the Lord says, I've had all nations that I've revealed myself to write their material, and ultimately you'll have the, the scriptures of the ten tribes. Ten tribes will have your scripture. And you know what I'm hopeful you will do? 
I'll hopeful that when they hand you the scriptures of the ten tribes to read, you'll already have the standard works so completely digested that you catch the significance of all the things that are in those ten tribe scriptures. And you'll say, oh my goodness, that ties in beautifully to the writings of Jacob. Well, now, isn't that fascinating? That's exactly what Alma was talking about in chapter 42. See, then you'll appreciate that scriptures. Other people will thumb the pages and say, blah, 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 blah. it's very real interesting. Huh? But uh, it's just great when you, know, when you know enough about it so it starts all fitting together. I was in the mission field for six months before I heard anything that was familiar, uh, facetiously speaking. The hardest book I ever read was the New Testament. I didn't like the way the language was. It was cruddy, old English. Didn't go anywhere. It took too long to say it. I went through the New Testament three times before I began to enjoy reading the scriptures. I was only 17 when I went on my mission, and it just did not appeal to me. And, you know, let's get going with something here. And uh, all this stuff, uh, gee, what's Paul talking about anyway? I wonder if he really knew what he's talking about here. Uh, then I, I heard somebody... Um, I get up one night in a meeting and they told something out of the book of Acts and I recognized it. See, my generation didn't study the scriptures. We went to Sunday school and fooled around, passed notes and so forth. And at least we stayed in the church. That's about the most we could get credit for. But you can see how hard up they were for missionaries. When I went at 17, I was the only missionary from the entire community of San Bernardino. It was in the local paper. It was such a big event. So... Um, uh, I, I see you don't have uh, it's hard for you to visualize how far down the church went before it started up through the new era etc we're, we're on the rise now this is just thrilling for me to have lived this long to see the change but I recognized something in a talk and I said oh I know about that that's uh, Acts chapter 13 and that's, that's great I recognize that and it was kind of exciting to recognize something so I know what people go through they open up the scriptures it's strange territory and if they don't compel themselves to keep going They'll get bored and flip on the boob tube and watch a football game. It's much more exciting. I can promise you it's more exciting until you know your scripture. And then you'll turn off the boob tube after the news. There won't be anything on there interesting enough and worthwhile enough to compete with your scripture. And you will learn to feast on the words of Christ. Now, I, I, I don't blame young people when they say it's a little tedious because it was for me. But I flip off the TV now. My family will testify to you that they have a hard time getting me to watch a program because I am I'm finding some, some things in here now that haven't been dug as far as I can tell. And it's time we got them in some books, called them to people's attention. There isn't anything that appears on TV as exciting as discovery, real discovery. Theirs is fiction. This is history. So... When Nephi gets over toward the end here and he says, feast on the words of the scriptures, feast on the words of Christ, you'll reach that stage. And maybe already the Spirit has worked on you to the point where you've begun to feel the power of this work. Now, it took me a long time to feel the power of it in the Old Testament. That's a hard book to study. I kept saying to my wife, I hope somebody writes a book on the Old Testament one of these days and puts in all the things the church knows. So out would come books for the institute and the seminaries and what were they? Right out of the University of Chicago Seminary. Nothing about Melchizedek out of the Book of Mormon. Nothing about the revelations of God in the, in the Doctrine and Covenants that explain whole segments of the Old Testament. Nothing out of the Book of Moses. Yours is the first generation that's had it. The first generation had it with the prophet Joseph, uh, Orson Pratt and Parley P. Pratt were just excellent on the Old Testament. But meanwhile, it got lost. You see why our Heavenly Father gets discouraged with his children sometimes? We're not so brilliant. We kind of drop the ball on him. We just don't carry it like we should. Anyway, it's coming back up again, and I'm thrilled with it. Nephi says toward the latter part of his book that he knew all about the coming of Christ, the terrible destruction. He knew about the wars between the Lamanites uh, who would fight right down to the time Columbus came. He watched the Spanish come in and conquer uh, the Aztecs. He watched them conquer the Incas. He saw the French come in and take over the Indians and, and mobilize them and then drive them up in North America. Then he saw the English come in. We reduced the population of the Indians to less than a million here in, the northern, in North America. Less than a million. There were millions of Indians here when the Gentiles arrived. 
And now they're rising up again. They're coming up in population. They're probably uh, somewhere around uh, between, uh, between 100 and 150 million descendants of Lehi now on the Western Hemisphere. They're coming up. And they're becoming a well-educated people. And they're becoming leaders of their nations. Watch it. Because if the Gentiles betray God on this continent, those are the people that are going to conquer and take over this continent. And when you get up to 3rd Nephi next uh, semester, about April, the Savior told the Nephites all about the United States 1974, 75, 76, 77. It's all in there. And we are at the crossroads in the United States. We're going to decide now whether we'll go into Christ and go towards Satan worship, immorality, depravity and degeneracy, or whether we'll say we've had enough of X and R's and so forth. Even the PG's are X now. Uh, we've had enough of that. We've had enough of this oh, curiously interesting uh, perverted literature that's been called good literature and that's even come required reading in some of our English classes, which is a disgrace to the, uh, to the tastes of our people, where four-letter words are casually taken for granted. I was raised on construction camps, and there aren't any of those words I haven't heard over and over again. But they're filthy, they're dirty, they're ugly, they're sordid. And to call that good literature is a reflection on taste and judgment. So if we can turn the tide, and if we can get the, get it going back and in the other direction, get away from the, from the 50s, the 60s, and part of the 70s, and start it moving now into a higher direction, we can save this nation. That's the word of the Lord. We can save the nation. Otherwise, we can't save the nation. It'll destroy itself. And you'll have a great population, uh, a depopulation explosion. That's what's coming. A great depopulation explosion is coming, where few men will be left. All the prophets have talked about it. And it says if you know what God is doing and what he's allowing to happen, you won't get scared. Otherwise, your heart will fail you for fear. You'll think everything's come apart at the seams. So this, this is a great book that we're reading. Now, um, Nephi says he's prepared to close. He says, I wish I'd included more of the writings of whom? I thought he was going to say Isaiah, but he said he's brother Jacob. Oh, he said that brother Jacob of mine, he was great. Well, we were going to get to the book of Jacob, and lo and behold, he only gave us a couple of sermons. We were in hopes he'd really unload. Jacob is a little book. Nephi loved this baby brother of his. Born out in the wilderness, 18 years or more younger than, uh, than Nephi. 16 to 18, somewhere in there, younger than Nephi. But he loved that younger brother of his. That younger brother lived to be about 100, by the way. Jacob did. Nephi died when he was about 72, as nearly as we can say. Now he says, follow Christ's example. Be baptized. Receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then let the Holy Ghost work within you because any time you're speaking under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you are speaking with the voice of what? Of the authorized priesthood from beyond the veil, which we call angels. You are speaking with the voice of angels when you come with a message that is from beyond the veil dictated to you by the Holy Ghost. That's the voice of angels. That's why we attend our conferences. That's what the angels of God would have us hear. And we have them on this side of the veil to tell us. Then he has that instruction, feast upon the words of Christ. Get so you enjoy it. And he says it twice, as a matter of fact. And then he keeps repeating, believe on God, repent of your sins, make your commitments to God in baptism, have hands laid on your head by someone that has authority, and receive the Holy Ghost, and then endure to the end. He said, that's the pattern. And if you'll just get on the wonderful, straight, narrow pathway leading to the tree of life, you'll make it. And you'll be happy in life. Now he says, pray before you undertake any endeavor. Pray before you play your football game. Yourself, that you'll do your best. I don't ever pray to win as such per se, that, but I, that I will do my best, that I will do justice. I, I think the most dedicated prayer in my early life came when I was 14. I was attending the War Stake Academy in Mexico. I was a freshman at the academy. And uh, someone came up to me and said, on J-Day, which was May the f Cinco de Mayo, 5th of May, a celebration on J-Day in 
which is their 4th of July down there. We're going to have some programs, and we'd like to have you represent the freshman class in, in a debate. Will you do that? Well, I'm trained in church to say, yes, I'll do that. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. They said, have you had any experience debating? And I said, no, what do we do? They said, yeah, I've never done it before. And I said, no. Well, nobody else wants to do it, so you do it, will you? And Fanny Bluth will be your partner. I said, well, what do we do? Well, you discuss both sides of a question. And you take one side, and the senior class will take the other side, and you debate. So um, I said, what are we debating? I said, resolve that the alien laws of Mexico should be enforced. I said, which side are we on? He said, well, you're on the side of the United States, that they shouldn't be enforced, which meant that nobody could own property in Mexico unless you were a Mexican citizen. Uh, I said, well, who will be the judges? Well, El Presidente of uh, Colonia Juarez, um, a mayor, uh, and um, other officials that would be, uh, at least I thought, biased. But in any event, um, I said, all right, good. So anyway, we, uh, we went ahead and prepared our debate. And Fanny Bluth prepared a talk, and I prepared a book. We never even sat down together to decide what we're going to divide up. I thought I was just going to give a talk, you know, like in church, 10-minute talk. They said, I had 10 minutes, so I'm going to give a talk on why I thought it would be good for Mexico to allow Americans to come down there and invest their money and own property and build it up and bring capital down. That'd be good for Mexico. As it turned out, that was the correct position. Fanny Bluth, uh, she worked out hers. Uh, I got worried after a while, though. I went to some friends and I said, in a debate, how do you proceed? What do you do to... Kind of I have to give a little talk. Well, they said, well, what you do is to go to the library and get all the information there that would help the opposition and take it out. <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyway, um, I found out that the two sharpest seniors, one running for student body president, another fellow from Los Angeles who was down there going to school like I was, I mean, he was, he was really sharp. And, and if he won the debate, you got a J-pin. You see, a beautiful gold J-pin. And Sunday before the debate, he was going around and saying, well, I'll have a J-pin there next Sunday. I thought, you will, too. <laughs> so I got worried. I, in two weeks, I lost 14 pounds. That's a pound a day. And at 14, you can't afford to lose a pound a day. <laughs> and the night before the day, debate, I didn't sleep a wink. I was praying all night. You know what I was praying for? that I wouldn't disgrace my, fa my grandfather, who was state president, my family, everybody who was going to be there expecting me to do, you know, credibly well. That's all I ask the Lord. Will you please help me just do kind of well? <laughs> just so it won't be awful. Just, <laughs> you know. And uh, so anyway, we held, held the debate, and, and I got up and gave my speech, and, and, but I didn't read it. I didn't read it. And I noticed they really listened. And I was scared, and my heart was palpitating. I hadn't had any sleep all night. I'm kind of groggy, but I gave it. And then they gave their talk, but they read it. And Fanny Booth gave her talk, and she gave most of hers extemporaneous and read a little bit of it. And I noticed the minute that she'd start reading, the, they'd stop listening. Then the other side got up and read their talks, but it was, it was oratorical. Oh, they really read these declamations and so forth. And then the chairman got up and said, and now we'll have the rebuttal from the negative. <laughs> I turned to Fanny Bluth and I said, what's rebuttal? <laughs> and she said, well, if you don't agree with anything they said, you get up and tell them you don't agree with it. Oh, a lot of things they said I don't agree with. So, so I got up and talked for two minutes rebuttal and sat down. And they got up and gave their rebuttal. And gee, they were sharp, polished people. They, but afterwards, I remembered that if you didn't read from a manuscript, people did seem to listen a little better. Anyway, we sat there, and I said, okay, Fanny, when they announce the winners, let you and I just be the first one over there to congratulate them. Let's, let's show them we're good sports. She said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. We'll be good sports. <laughs> so these Mexican officials all handed in their reports, and the chairman stood up, and it was three to nothing. It even, and he announced it, one, two, and uh, three, and so forth, and I'm up on my feet. <laughs> Next thing I knew, Fanny Bluth was pulling on my coat. She said, we won. <laughs> well, 
I swore that I would never debate again in my whole life. The, the very next year I was, at, or two years later, I was at San Marino High School and back on the debate team. In any event, I learned how to pray out of desperation. 